Welcome everyone to the BRI's AP US Skills Prep Webinar. We hope that you are returning and joining us again from last night. Um, and we hope that you found that helpful. If you are new tonight, welcome, welcome. I am Nicole Moretti and I am a in, in class teacher this year, actually. And this is my 31st year. I also am a professional development instructor for uh, the Bill of Rights Institute. So I do know what kind of anxiety you people are feeling right now, getting ready for this US um, AP US exam. So we just want you to know that this webinar series is here to help you feel more confident and be prepared for the exam. That's our whole purpose for this five week series. We want to know in the comments section if you are finding things helpful, let us know. Um, keep the chat and the questions going as we go along tonight. I will be monitoring those and kind of directing some questions to Daniel as we go. Um, let us know if you've checked out the Bill of Rights Institute's website and what things you like on there. So right now, let's just introduce again our APUS extraordinary teacher, Mr. Daniel Jose. Um, he graduated summa cum laude from USA, UCLA. I don't know why I can't say that right tonight. Um, in 2016, he was California Teacher of the Year and a finalist for the National Teacher of the Year. He's a nationally board certified teacher and we feel very privileged and happy to have him doing these webinars for us. So I'm gonna turn things over to him and again, Let's see that chat get active. All right, everyone. What's up? It's good to see some familiar faces in the, not faces, names in the chat. Welcome back. Um, and so I just want to get us started because we got a limited amount of time with one another and I want to value our time. So first and foremost, please make sure you go into the Google Doc. Let me see. Someone saying access denied. No way, I got you VIP treatment. Come on, everyone. Everyone should be able to get in there. All you gotta do is go to file. Eric, what's up? I see you. Go to file and make a copy and you will have access to this document. You could write on it. You can, you can make it into cool fonts. You could put little unicorns all over it. You can do whatever you need to do. Uh, and uh, hopefully this will help you out for your AP exam. Today, my good friends, we are going to be rocking uh, a very important topic, and that is reform across different periods in American history. And I decided to focus on three because all three have been tested very often because they're very important moments in American history. Uh, and basically we're gonna be looking at the progressive movement, the new deal, and we're gonna do a preview of the great society because you know, when I, when I decided to kind of run this session, I realized most of you all are not even close to the Great Society. And if you are already covering it, dang, you are fast, like cheetah speed and uh, much respect to you. But I want to just give everyone just a moment to familiarize yourself with the document before uh, I kind of give you the quick overview lecture that's going to be a little bit of a review as well as connecting some of the big ideas. And then we're going to spend the second part of today's session looking at the SAQ. And if you don't know what the SAQ is, we're gonna explain it to you. It's not a new street gang. It is something you're gonna need to do on the test. So just really quickly, let me just tell you what the format of this document's like. Here's some context for you. So just in case you're kind of wondering about context and how to build it, uh, the goals and the why of these different reform programs, I'm gonna go over this in some detail in just a moment. This particular part is significance, which is kind of what these programs did and, and what these reforms sought to accomplish. There are a ton of programs. And the good news is you don't need to memorize them all. I'm going to kind of give you some tips about what you should focus on. And then there's some failures. You know, the things in history, nothing's ever perfect. Nobody's ever perfect. But then they also say practice makes perfect. So that always really confuses me. But I'm going to kind of go over some of the, the, the setbacks or the failures. And then there's just some miscellaneous things that I didn't quite know where to put it. So there it's right there. 
If you scroll down, you will see a little preview of some SAQs. We're gonna actually look at one of them in detail and we're gonna look at another one that's not here. And then if you are at the end of today's session going, I don't even know what the progressive movement is, you are going to be able to click these and take a look at them. And uh, here are the key concepts so you can know exactly what uh, the college board wants you to know. So I'll kind of come back to that at the end, but those are the key concepts for you. So let me just check the chat, um, making sure it says you need access. Uh-oh, someone needs access. If you're having trouble with the Google Doc, we'll figure that out. I think it's good. And if it's not, I promise you at the end of today's session, I'm gonna find a way to get it to you. So uh, we got you, we got you. So let's kind of get into it. Um, and like I said, I'm gonna kind of frame some of the important ideas and then we're gonna come back to the SAQ. So the first thing to kind of keep in mind is that this kind of period before the progressive era, laissez-faire economic policies pretty much dominated the, the era. And that era is known as the Gilded Age, that period after the Civil War, all the way up until the 1890s. You have rapid growth of industry. You have this move to the cities, both from people in America, you know, people leaving rural areas, going to the cities, and immigrants coming into the United States. And so there's this kind of laissez-faire economic approach. And just in case you don't know and you want to impress your friends over the next holiday dinner, social distanced, of course, laissez-faire is a French term, which means allowed to do. And in the context of economic policy, it's basically government should stay out of the way of business. There should not be government regulations. And so this was really the dominant ideology of the period before the progressive movement. And there were a lot of good things that happened during the Industrial Revolution, right? All this new technology, economic opportunities. That's why all these immigrants are coming into the United States. But there were challenges, too. And one of the things that starts happening, and increasingly it becomes obvious that it's happening, is that as a result of industrialization, urbanization, and modernization, some people were being left behind. And those challenges, let me just show you just a quick preview for example, cities are growing really quickly. And if you look at these two charts, you know that in and of itself is not a bad thing, but if Chicago goes from 300,000 people, which there've been people in Chicago for, for many, many years, French settlers had gone there, there were indigenous people in that area even before that, but in just 30 years, it goes to 1.7 million. Think about the consequences of that kind of rapid growth. And one of them is just like the fact that where are you gonna put all these people? So you get the rise of slums, tenements, very crowded. The urban poverty goes up. Just where are you gonna put all the trash? You know, the human waste, you know, the sanitation services can't keep up. These are realities. Another reality is the fact that you have corporate consolidation. Companies are merging together and that alone isn't necessarily bad, but it can be if there is less and less competition and you have the growth of trust and monopolies, which basically means there is a limited amount of competition, which means prices can kind of go up, quality of products, there's not a, a real need to innovate. And so there was a challenge, both economically for the consumer, but also politically. This one's showing, clearly Rockefeller has government in the palm of his hand. And this probably cartoon is the most famous from this period. It is this Gilded Age politics, the bosses of the Senate. And there was a feeling, especially in the 1890s, that the government wasn't really working for the, the common men or the regular everyday people in America. It's dominated by trust, big business, and even at the city level, you have the rise of those political bosses like Tammany Hall in New York. Not to mention workers' wages were going up, so that's a good thing, but child labor was still a problem because many immigrants needed their families to work in order to make ends meet. So anytime my three-year-old daughter gets out of hand, I show her this picture and say, hey, better watch yourself. You might end up in a, you know, what is this, clams or mussels factory deshelling them for some, some company, and she usually calms down. Not to mention, <coughs> oh, I forgot that sound effect was in there. Long hours, you know, 12, 14-hour days was common, and hazardous working conditions was the norm. And so, you know, with this lack of regulation, you had all sorts of problems going on, and many people began to demand that something get done. 
not to mention you have pollution that wasn't being addressed. You know, it's just the wild, wild west when it came to kind of the rules were just very lax or non-existent. And so when we talk about the progressive movement, there's not really a start date. It's not like someone or some president or a congressperson or some leader says, hey, everyone, we need a progressive movement. It's a series of movements that take place from the 1890s, no start date, up until, and you could put 1917 or 1920, really World War I is going to kind of happen during it. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the impact of World War I on the movement itself. And so this is a big deal, and you have all these different reforms. Now, here's the thing to keep in mind. It's a response to a variety of problems. So you've got child labor. Some progressives care about that. Some progressives care about corruption in politics, maybe making democracy work for the common person. Some people are concerned about the growth of monopolies and trusts. Some people are worried about urban poverty. Some people are worried about the environment. It's not a coherent movement kind of holding hands and skipping, saying, let's all do this, united we stand. It's a variety of movements. And so that's important to keep in mind, but there's a few things that bind this thing together. One is, it is many progressives are rejecting this laissez-faire approach to government. There's a belief during the progressive movement that people and government should play a role in regulating, monitoring, and trying to improve society when problems exist. And this is a big kind of shift. And some would even say, if you talk about like turning points, continuity and change over time. So we're not going to get into the progressive movement in great detail today, but on the sheet of paper, the graphic organizer, the Google Doc, you will see a variety of reforms. And as you can see by just looking at this image, the progressive movement itself was quite diverse. Sometimes it was politicians like Theodore Roosevelt, Robert Lafayette. Sometimes it was labor leaders like Mother Jones. Other times it is muckrakers. It's a variety of different movements. W.B. Du Bois trying to address the plight uh, in the systematic injustices uh, for African-Americans in American society. It's a variety of movements as a whole. Now, here's the other thing, because this is going to be very different than the New Deal. One of the ways that reforms were kind of brought to the attention of the American people was through muckrakers, muckraking. And they're nothing more than novelists and journalists who are trying to expose problems to the American public. You know, if I'm average Joe living in, you know, the city, I may not know what it's like to work in a Chicago meatpacking plant or to be a Polish immigrant or to be a child working in a factory or to be a woman, perhaps, who doesn't have the right to vote. And so there's all these different examples of muckrakers. You don't have to know them all. But the other important thing to keep in mind is, let me go back here for a moment, women play a key role during this movement. And so that's another significant part of the progressive movement. Women, especially middle-class women who have the ability and the time to dedicate themselves to various causes, they're gonna be a very important part of the progressive movement. The other thing I wanna point out, and this is key because our spoiler, the SAQ is gonna be looking at the differences and the similarities between these different movements is it's not always the government. Oftentimes it's regular people pushing for reforms, saying, hey, government, we need you to do more and demanding that steps be taken. So I'm not gonna go through this list unless we have a little bit more time at the end, but there's gonna be reforms dealing with the economy. And some of those reforms are gonna be enacted by presidents and political parties. They're gonna strengthen policies like the Interstate Commerce Commission or trust busting using the Sherman Antitrust Act. It's gonna be during the presidency of Theodore Roosevelt, William Howard Taft, Woodrow Wilson. So it's not any one political party. There were Democratic progressives, Republican progressives. There's gonna be consumer protections. There's gonna be expansion to democratic rights. You know, one of the concerns was that there was too much control of big business in the economy and in politics, so you're gonna get reforms. Then some progressives are gonna focus on moral reform. Getting people to stop drinking is gonna be a, a popular one, temperance. And of course, 18th Amendment will eventually, eventually be passed. You're gonna have environmental issues. And then you're gonna have just other reforms like the settlement house movement and child labor laws. 
So there's so many examples, and I'm just going to speed through them so that you can get a sense. And hopefully you kind of start going, oh, yeah, I remember that. Remember, the Sherman Antitrust Act was around since 1890, but it wasn't really being used the way it was intended until people like Theodore Roosevelt, because of pressure by groups and advocates and reformers, starts actually exercising that kind of ability to break up what were deemed bad trust. You know, when Upton Sinclair wrote The Jungle, Theodore Roosevelt kind of responds to the outcry from the American public. And we're going to look at this cartoon a little bit later, and we're going to get the Meat Inspection Act that's passed. You're going to get the federal government overseeing the nation's consumer uh, items, such as meat or the nation's drugs. Pure Food and Drug Act is going to be another kind of reform. And I'm going through this quickly, and you're probably going, whoa, 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 slow down. Don't worry, you don't need to know them all. You just need to know the big kind of examples to demonstrate that you understand what the progressive movement was about. Uh, so a lot of reforms from Robert Lafayette, a politician known as the Wisconsin idea, these reforms like the initiative, the recall, the referendum, all of them were designed to put more power, political power in the hands of the uh, average voter in America. Uh, I was going to ask you a question. Who is the most beautiful woman in the world? Everyone in the chat. It's Women's History Month. Let's go. Who are we going? What's the most beautiful? Who's the most beautiful woman in the world? You can't say my mama either. Well, it's mother. It's mother nature. Another part of the progressive movement was just dealing with the consequences of unrestrained capitalism. Trees being cut down, animals being hunted, buffalo being exterminated, partly to undermine Native American resistance bison, hydraulic mining, pollution from factories. And so all of these things, you, you actually had groups like the Sierra Club pushing for preservation policy. And so once again, it's not always coming from the top. It's not always coming from politicians saying, let's do this. In some cases, it's normal people like John Muir advocating for preservation with the Sierra Club, trying to um, deal with these issues. So the progressive movement is a very diverse set of movements going on. It includes women's suffrage. You know, women could only vote in four Western states by 1910. And women began to demand that that become a constitutional amendment. And so part of the progressive movement is demanding, and Alice Paul and the National Women's Party was a big part of this kind of reform as well, demanding a constitutional amendment, which eventually the war happens and women start protesting. We demand that you actually honor what you're saying, President Wilson. You're saying we're fighting this war to make the world safe for democracy. What about American women? And that's the other thing that's important to understand about, about the progressive movement. Not all progressives are on the right side of all the issues. Um, for instance, Wilson's very reluctant to get involved in the fight for women's suffrage or to support the 19th Amendment. And it's not until women start putting that pressure that we see this kind of movement gain enough steam, partly because of World War I, but also because of the consistent uh, fight of American women. There's other reforms, temperance, settlement houses. There's also failures. And this is a very important point that I think sometimes gets overlooked. You see that word progressive, and you think progress, and you think, oh, it's gotta be all positive. Unfortunately, some progressives we're not too good at dealing with things such as racism. You know, if you remember the, the, the defeat of Reconstruction, and we're gonna have a review session about that, so make sure you're there for it, a little commercial break. Uh, black men had the right to vote since the 15th Amendment, but yet systematic violence, terrorist groups like the KKK were, were intentionally keeping black men from voting. And if that didn't work, literacy tests, poll taxes, property requirements, and grandfather clauses were implemented and instituted. And guess what? It was not necessarily many progressive reformers. Theodore Roosevelt, Taft, Wilson, most of the leaders we associate with the progressive movement, they don't do too much. In fact, in some cases, they do more harm than good when it came to the plight of African-American people. So you get people like Du Bois and Ida B. Wells who are gonna advocate for anti-lynching laws, Groups like the NAACP trying to dismantle Jim Crow, and unfortunately not gonna make a whole lot of progress early on. 
So the progressive movement is a very messy, complex thing. Some achievements, some setbacks, not an organized movement. That's some of the important things you should keep in mind. Now, we're going to switch gears real quick because I want to get to this SAQ. You know, you have the progressive movement roughly from the 1890s to 1920. World War I happens, so a lot of the domestic reform stuff gets put on hold. But some things happen, like the 19th Amendment and the 18th Amendment, partly because of the war and partly because of the work before the war. Then you get the Roaring Twenties. I can go all day about the Roaring Twenties, all complexities there. And then, of course, everything goes in the toilet on October 19th. 29. Y'all know what happens on October 1929, right? The Great Depression. A lot of people think, oh, Great Depression, uh, the stock market crash, that, that, that must be the cause. The Great Depression has many different causes. The stock market crash is more of a symptom of the problems going on in the 1920s, even before October 1929. There was an unequal distribution of wealth. Some people were making a ton of money. Some people weren't making much. So they had to buy things on credit. You had high tariffs. You had war debts globally. You had overproduction in farming and industry. You had an inconsistent monetary policy. And then, of course, you have a stock market that's not regulated, wild speculation, margin buying. The whole thing goes poop, October 1929, which leads to the Great Depression. 25% unemployment. Great Depression is going to roughly last, once again, there's no real end date, but you know, up until our entry into World War II, the economy was still a bit sluggish. But a little bit before 1941, we, we, we start to uh, come out of it. But I want to just point something out here because us youngsters, I just said us youngsters, I'm not young, but you youngsters, you might be like me when I learned 25% unemployment and think to yourself, well, that's not too much. I mean, that's bad if you're one of the 25%. But here's the reality. If you look at the economy since World War II, we have not approached too much above 11% in all of that time. And you were the generation that was kind of little during the last big economic collapse. I'm not counting the pandemic situation right now, but in 2008, 2009, there was an economic collapse and the peak unemployment was around 10 to 11%. In the eighties, there was a brief moment where it was a little bit above 10%, 25% unemployment. It is unprecedented. And that's just the unemployed. It was higher for certain groups, women, people of color, certain areas, certain industries, the unemployment rate was higher. And so that leads us to our next reform because people start demanding that the government do something. And of course, the government at the time is headed by the president, President Hoover. Little Great Depression humor for you. Hard times are still hoovering over us. See what they did there? See what they did there? Pretty creative, huh? And scenes like this were all too common. People desperate, people needing help. The irony here, the world's highest standard of living. There's no way like the American way, and yet people are desperate for relief. Now, I want to point something out here. This really shook the American public's faith in this system, this American capitalist system. People felt that they failed or the system was failing them, and they needed some sort of help. Homeboy's literally walking around with his resume on his billboard, stalked by a stork. Reminds me of the Biggie Smalls lyric, got baby on the way, mad bills to pay. He's got a baby on the way. He wants work. He weighs 135 pounds, which is really, really, man, what, what is he, what's his workout routine? I would really like to know. But he needs assistance. In the midst of all this, Mother Nature kicks farmers down one more time with the Dust Bowl. And the bonus army, you have World War I veterans. And they start marching to Washington, D.C. saying, give us our bonus. Congress says we ain't got enough money. And Hoover doesn't really do much except send the military after the veterans of the military. And this becomes quite the scene and a national embarrassment for Hoover. And basically, you have this kind of Great Depression and Hoover really kind of believes in a very different approach of rugged individualism. He doesn't really want the federal government to kind of get too directly involved. He's worried about destroying people's self-reliance. He's worrying, worrying about increasing the federal deficit. He's worrying about kind of, you know, 
introducing policies that may seem too socialistic. And as a result, he's very reluctant to do a whole lot. That is, of course, until things were really bad and he does make a few moves um, based upon this idea of trickle-down economics. So he does the Reconstruction Finance Corporation where the federal government is gonna give federal loans, tax breaks to railroads, businesses. And the hope was, the belief was, that when the government gives these economic incentives to businesses, the positive impacts would trickle down to American workers. This would create jobs, this would reduce layoffs, this would stabilize wages, and there would be other benefits. And I'm not here to argue whether or not this is good philosophy or not. What's important though is at the time, the American people said, we need help now. We, we can't wait for this stuff to trickle down. And so as a result, by 1932, Hoover is not very popular amongst many Americans. And a guy by the name of Franklin Roosevelt enters into the presidential race and you have an election that basically is not gonna go well for Hoover. During the campaign, Roosevelt promises a new deal to the American people. He doesn't even know what he really has in mind. He just says, we need to do something. And so what's important is the New Deal proposed by Franklin Roosevelt was not a organized pre-planned set of programs. It's not like he was rolling up and said, let me show you my plan. And a huge scroll fell down and he had all the programs outlined. We're going to do this one on Monday, this one on Tuesday. It was about government action to help out. Franklin Roosevelt easily, easily wins the election of 1932. He also gets something that's important for you kiddos when you take government. He also gets both houses of Congress, the Senate and the House of Reps, which means he's going to be able to get his agenda passed without any obstruction. He wins, and the approach is very different from Franklin Roosevelt. It's this rejection of this rugged individualism. It's a rejection of this kind of Republican trickle-down policies of the 1920s. And the American people in 1932, because of the economic devastation, were very welcome to these changes. And as a result, he takes office in 33. He'll be president till 45, only president to be elected four times. And the New Deal will implement a whole bunch of policies, laws, programs to deal with the effects of the Great Depression. And they're oftentimes known as the alphabet agencies because they're na named, you know, after their acronyms, TVA, WPA, things like that. And so this is a big shift. But the whole reason, you know, the progressive movement had a different set of reasons. This reason for the New Deal was providing the three R's, relief for the poor, get them the help they need, recovery, get the economy back on track, and then reform so that we don't have to deal with this all over again. And so when you're studying for your test, you don't need to know every program. You need to be able to show a few examples of relief, a few examples of recovery, and a few of reform. But the progressive movement had its set of goals, deal with the consequences of industrialization, urbanization, and other problems. The Great Depression and the New Deal, the whole purpose of the New Deal is to deal head on the federal government with the challenges presented by the Great Depression. So you will be able to later on add to this Google Doc, kind of, you know, flesh out some of the uh, different programs. Here is a list of some. And uh, like I said, you don't need to know them all. I gave you what I think are the most important ones that I would focus my attention on. Uh, but what's important is the New Deal is going to uh, have a legacy of reform because some of these programs are still around, Social Security, FDIC but it ain't perfect. And before we kind of begin the SAQ process, you know, there's a first 100 days, there's a second new deal, there's a whole bunch of programs. There's some challenges too. You know, everything in history gets complex. There's no fundamental change in race relations. Interestingly enough, Roosevelt is going to not directly address race relations. He's not gonna call for a federal anti-lynching law. Some of his new deal programs are going to have segregation in them. And there's a lot of criticism of the failure of the New Deal of addressing racial injustice. Roosevelt doesn't because he needs Southern Democrats to get his policies put forth, but it's a similarity with the progressive era. The other thing is it leads to criticism. 
And there's going to be a backlash amongst conservatives and Republicans and people, especially when we get to the 60s and 70s and 80s, about this growing federal government. And of course, the biggest criticism is it does not on its own end the Great Depression. World War II would do that. And so these are some of the important things. And before we kind of get into the Great Society, I want to go to the SAQ for a moment. So quickly in the chat, wait, are you supposed to say vibe check if you're just seeing how someone's doing? My students always lie to me and tell me to say dumb things. And then, then I look foolish amongst the youth. How y'all doing out there? Any questions? My check, my check, my check. Let's go to the SAQ before we get back to the Great Society. What's up, everyone? Come here often. Um, before I begin, there's a couple things about the SAQ I want to tell y'all. This year, the SAQ, I said this last night, is going to be perhaps one of the most important part of the APUSH exams. If you are doing the session two or session three, you're going to have a whole bunch of SAQs. Uh, and those SAQs, just in case you don't know and you want to look cool on the streets, we call the short answer question the SAQ. So now you could be hip with all your friends. But the SAQ can be boiled down to a simple strategy that oftentimes gets overly complicated, probably by me more than anyone. You want to ace the SAQ. And when you ace the SAQ, it's a very simple process, but some people get a little turned off or a little scared by it. But basically all you're doing is you're going through these three steps. You answer the question, and I'm going to show you how to do this. You restate the question and provide an answer and a claim. Okay, so you're gonna answer this question. Step two, you're gonna cite your reason. You're gonna provide a piece of evidence. Now, I usually say give more than one just in case, but all you need is one, a piece of evidence to prove your answer claim. And then step three is you're going to expand the specific factual info. So you're gonna explain your evidence and how it answers the question. In other words, link it back up so that the reader, the person who doesn't know you, but wants to find a reason to give you points, they can in their good judgment say, yep, you earned it. That's all you're doing. It does not have a sentence limit. There's not like it has to be done in four sentences, but I usually tell students that when you're doing the SAQ, all you're doing is answering the question, citing evidence. That's it. So that's another way of looking at these. And what oftentimes happens is that students either do way too little or way too much, and both can be dangerous for different reasons. So each section, so it's usually divided into A, B, and C. Each section should be around two to four sentences. Now, here's the deal. We're all different levels of writing. Some of y'all are like, freaking just you, you you write like at a level that i can't even imagine you can accomplish your goal i've seen it done even in one really amazing sentence but more often than not two to three even maybe four is good we'll show you what it looks like you don't want to be too vague a lot of times students will just put an answer but they won't explain the answer or provide specific evidence that's dangerous i'm going to show you how in just a moment the other problem is being too detailed. You don't need to give us everything you know about something to get the point. Because what ends up happening, especially this year, I think there's five, who knows, they might have changed it. But if you spend too much time on any one SAQ, because there's no one telling you, okay, time's up for number one, go to the second SAQ, you got to pace yourself. So get yourself some sort of way to monitor your time because you don't want to spend all this time on one question when there's some easy SAQs, you could easily stack the points. So make sure you give relevant historical examples that's relevant to the prompt. Because you could say all, all sorts of amazing things about some historical event, but if it ain't relevant to the prompt, you're gonna get a fat zero, so make sure it's relevant. The last thing is you either get the point or you don't. There's no in-between, which is frustrating. Uh, and each part is graded individually. You can get a point for A and get no points for B and C, or you can get no points for B and A, but still get the point in C. So it's important that you try each section because 
even the thing that may seem easy. An easy SAQ in your mind is worth the same amount as a hard one. So tackle them as such. So let's take a look at our first one. Just a quick check in the chat. How many of you uh, on a scale of one to 10, what's, what's the vibe out there about SAQs? Like 10 being, ah, these are pretty easy. One being, oh my God, nope, get away. Or one is like, you don't even know what that is. Where are we at here as a, as a crew, as a YouTube community, as a, an A-Push? Uh, I heard A-Push be called a gang, a cult, uh, 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 a family, which, come on now, relax. Uh, but what's the vibe out there in terms of the A-Push stuff? Okay. Oh, I see you, Evelyn. It's your 10. It's your 10. Maddie's being all humble with her seven. Haley, eight. Okay. A little mix. So this is the SAQ. We, I got two on deck today. Um, two that we're going to go in, into some detail with an additional third just for uh, hopefully maybe later on your teacher will give it to you and you can pretend like you've never seen it before and then totally uh, score really well on it. Hint, hint. Uh, but this is a type of SAQ. There's different types. There's some that have a uh, secondary sources. So they'll give you two historians usually talking about an event. So two historians talking about the New Deal. And one will say it sucked. The other one will say it's the greatest thing since, you know, sliced bread. And you have to then determine what their point of views are and then give examples that would support their point of view. I'm not doing those because, um, it, one, it's hard for you to read that, those big passages. So I don't want to spend too much time, but those ones are a little, uh, it's, it's very similar to a stimulus. You get that. This is the other type you get. There's no stimulus. It's just, boom, answer the question. So this one's a straightforward one. Describe one similarity between the progressive movement and the New Deal. Briefly describe one difference between the progressive movement and the New Deal. And then C is explain one reason for a difference between the progressive movement and a New Deal. And so, um, that, you know, if there wasn't that delay, I would ask you kind of like, what you, what you thinking? Um, let, let's just actually give it a go. And I'll just kind of uh, freestyle off the top of my head. If you were to tackle A, what kinds of things might you bring up here? And, and, and you know, imagine you sit down and you want to start writing A. Uh, what, what, what's, what, what's the uh, similarity between the progressive movement and the New Deal? And it doesn't have to be from what I went over, because I was just giving you a quick, hey, don't forget, remember, these things happened. Um, what, what would you do for A? Think about what your response would be for B, and how would you tackle C? Because each part's its own part. And while you're kind of thinking about it, let me kind of show you what some students try to do, and this ain't it. This ain't getting it. Um, there were many similarities between the progressive movement and the New Deal. Both reform movements increased government and tried to fix society. That is correct, but it really doesn't um, elaborate or explain, like when you say increased government, what does that mean? What government? Um, when you say fix society, it's just too vague. And so there's times, you know, depending upon the cut scores where sometimes some, some simple stuff like this may squeak by, but more often than not, you ain't getting points for that if that's your response to A. The beautiful thing about the SAQ, unlike the multiple choice section, unlike sometimes looking at a document on the DBQ is there's many, many answers. And so here's one possible way to do this for a point. Both the progressive movement and the New Deal dramatically increased the power and scope of the federal government. Now, if you didn't use the word power and scope, you'd still be okay because it increased the federal government. During the progressive movement, the federal government was used to regulate business and ensure consumer safety. And during the New Deal, the federal government tried to provide relief to the American people through such programs as the Civilian Conservation Corps. That would get a point without a doubt. And I wanna say something 
Because if there's any teachers on here, you might be saying to yourself, well, that's a little bit more than they need to do. And that's 100% correct. You don't need to provide, you didn't have to say necessarily that it was going to regulate business. You didn't have to say consumer safety. You didn't even have to give the name of a program. But by doing that, you hammer home your point so well and so quickly that there's no doubt that you are without a, you're, you're going to be okay. And so for me, when I'm working on the SAQs, and unfortunately for my students, some of which are here and others that are not, we haven't had the time to really practice this as much as we normally would. We haven't been in school since last March. But when you're doing this, you want to be succinct to the point. And you want to make sure that you're clear that you know what this is. So this is an example that's going above and beyond what you need to do, but it's still short enough where you can do that and move on to part B and C and the other SAQs. Give you another example. Both the progressive movement and the New Deal failed to address the problem of systematic racism in American society. You didn't have to use the word systematic racism. You could have just said failed to address uh, the issue of civil rights. Many progressive reformers actively supported Jim Crow segregation in American life and New Deal programs such as the CCC segregated white and black participants. Boom, point. That's more than you need to do because it's not actually asking you for any example. It just says, what's a similarity? So what I often kind of will say when doing this in class is, even if it doesn't ask you, to, to give an example, giving one gives you that insurance that you're actually responding to the prompt that it's asking. So you could have just talked about both kind of failed to deal with the plight of African-American people. Both don't, did not deal with racial issues. But by adding that subtle thing, by saying that, you know, there were reformers who were progressives, you know, Woodrow Wilson, Clayton Antitrust Act, and, you know, but, but segregated the federal government. The New Deal, a lot of black voters voted for the Democratic Party because Franklin Roosevelt was seen as someone who is making a lot of progress for the plight of African-Americans in spite of not actually intentionally targeting them. But still, you had programs that, that hurt that community. And so both of these tackle that question, part A, and get the point. This one does not. And let me just show you something. And I'm looking in the chat and a lot of you um, are saying some things that are, are, are quite solid. All of these, if you were to elaborate on any of these, and there's others, you can easily get a point for part A. Both sought to preserve the capitalist system and lessen the negative consequences through reforms. You know, capitalism is what America has, but there's been bumps in the road. And so both the progressive movement, you know, is dealing with the consequences of the Industrial Revolution, the Great Depression is a consequence of the economy falling apart. So you can make an argument about that. Both addressed economic struggles of children and families. There were child labor laws in the progressive era, social security of the New Deal, mothers with uh, dependent children. Both rejected the economic philosophy of laissez-faire capitalism. Both faced pressure from more populist or radical movements to go further with reform. So, you know, there was a socialist party that gets a million votes during the progressive movement, Eugene, Eugene Debs. You know, during the uh, New Deal, Huey Long starts becoming really popular with his plan, Share Our Wealth. Both increase the power of the presidency in addressing problems in American society, you know. And it doesn't ask you to give an example, but I always say it doesn't hurt if you could do it quickly and succinctly. So Pure Food and Drug Act and Social Security are two laws signed by these presidents that kind of show the power of the presidency increasing. And there's many others. The point is, if you're able to show a similarity, you're good. And that's what you need to do. It's you going back to this, kind of showing you understand in a quick way with relevant examples and relevant to the prompt. Let me show you part B, and I'm not gonna go through as many different examples because I wanna get to the second question, which is I find even more challenging for a lot of students. So part B and C, I'm gonna show you an answer that actually answers both in one. Technically, on the SAQ, I think it's best if you respond to A, skip a line, respond to B, skip a line, respond to C. That way, if you think of something else, you can kind of go back and add some things. Um, but when they are grading your response, they are trained wherever your answer is. If you actually answer C and A, you can, st you can still get the point. 
So you want to be organized in your writing, but just know, you know, they're, they're looking for where you respond to the prompt. So you don't have to label it, but just skipping a line. Here's my A, here's my B, here's my C will be good. Here's something that actually answers both B and C. Remember, difference between the progressive movement and the New Deal. One difference between the progressive movement and the New Deal is the purpose of the reform movements. The progressive movement was not a unified movement tackling any one problem in American society, but rather a variety of reforms addressing problems such as political corruption, child labor, and the consequences of industrialization. The New Deal was a response by President Roosevelt to the devastation caused by the Great Depression and sought to provide relief, recovery, and reform to the American people. Done. This is way more than you need to do, but it's still simple enough. It shows you know the content and it shows you understand the key concepts which are part of the College Board's standards. It shows the difference, the motives of the thing, and then it, it kind of elaborates. The reason why it's doing relief recovery reform is because it's dealing with the Great Depression. The reason why it's not a unified because it's tackling a wide variety of problems. So this passage you see right there would get the point for both B and C. There's a ton of other things you could have used, but that's the one for this particular prompt. Both this answer and the answer here and here were all written by former students uh, a long time ago. Uh, these are not crafted by, you know, some genius teacher in some, you know, secret room somewhere. This is what students from their brain came up with. And so if you know your material, and that's the key thing, you know, you could spend all day practicing these SAQs, but you can't practice them unless you know the material that you can actually write about the material. But this is an example of what you need to do. And if you do this, you've already done more than you need to, and you've ensured your success on this particular prompt, okay? Let me see the questions really uh, quick, make sure we don't have anything uh, that's lingering, advocated government intervention. Yeah, so Scotchy B, like is that Scotch tape or, or Scotchy? I like that, Scotchy. Um, you, I would not put it all in one paragraph because for organizational purposes, I would separate it into an A, a B and a C. When you put it in one paragraph, there's nothing wrong with that, but there's a chance you'll forget to answer a particular part. And so separating them is fine, but I showed you this just so you know, you can technically get the point, uh, but I would definitely separate them into those areas. Once again, none of this matters unless you know the content. Let me show you another one that is very difficult for students. Um, so normally you're gonna have an SAQ with no stimulus and you'll usually get a pick. I don't know what they're doing this year, but you'll get that kind that we just saw. You'll get the one where there'll be two secondary sources, you know, some, some uh, uh, Gian or Gian, uh, you don't need to label A, B, or C, just skip, they'll, they'll figure it out. You don't need, no need to label. If you wanna label it because it makes you feel better, do it, but not necessary. They don't grade that. Um, this, the, the, the other type of SAQ you'll get is you'll get some sort of primary source and then you'll have to respond to it. This is hard, in my opinion, from my experience. And a lot of times it's a political cartoon. And the reason why I think this is hard uh, is, and yeah, back to Joe's point, it does help. And that's why if you just kind of do the answer A, answer B, and then answer C, the labeling is kind of implied. But yeah, if you want, go ahead and label and you'll, you'll, you'll make sure you hold yourself accountable to the response you're writing. Oftentimes I see students mess up the political cartoon ones. Uh, and that's because um, oftentimes you misread what the meaning of the cartoon is. Uh, this is the same case with document-based questions. When you do a DBQ and one of the documents is a political cartoon, sometimes we lose that satire or the use of humor or irony. And so this prompt, let me just kind of walk you through it, is as follows. Um, you are going to, the pre progressive image above depicts Theodore Roosevelt using the image A, B, and C, briefly describe one perspective expressed by the artist about the role of government in society, okay? So you have to, and this is important, we're gonna come back to it uh, in just a moment, because uh, they're asking you something very specific that students miss. So you've got to read the question. 
Remember AP, we learned last session, AP, answer the prompt, not the one you wish they said, but the one they're actually telling you. Explain how one event or development led to the historical situation depicted in the image, and then explain a specific outcome. And so this is dependent upon you interpreting the cartoon they present. And if you look at this cartoon, there's a lot of stuff you can do with it. And there's a lot of things that you can misread in this cartoon. If you look at this cartoon, there's a lot going on. And this is actually showing Theodore Roosevelt somewhat reluctantly, because you'll notice it says a nauseating job, but it must be done. He doesn't look too happy about doing it, but yet here he is doing it. The president, Congress is in the background, and he, as a result of muckrakers, remember Theodore Roosevelt was the one who kind of was critical of muckrakers, this idea that you're just kind of shining a light on this negative view of, of society. And so he was you know, a, a, a critic of some of the muckraker tactics, but yet here he is holding his nose as he kind of launches this investigation into this meat scandal. And so this particular prompt, notice what it's asking you. One perspective expressed by the artist about the role of government. He's not asking you, or they're not asking you, you know, what's the view of the artist alone? It's about specifically the role of government. So if you take a look, this is one way to respond. And then I'll kind of tell you a few different ways you could have done this uh, and equally have gotten the point. So one perspective expressed by the artist about the role of the government in society is that the federal government should take a more active role in regulating the economy and society as a whole. So you actually see Roosevelt kind of taking a role in terms of investigating. Congress is symbolized in the background. Both Theodore Roosevelt and Congress are shown in the cartoon reflecting the growing belief that these branches of government do more to protect the well-being of American citizens. That is answering the prompt in a way that correctly reflects what they're asking, what's the role of government, and goes into the perspective of the cartoonish. You could have, have gone in a lot of different directions. You could have talked about how this shows public sentiment or public opinion is changing about the role of government because there was such an outcry over this scandal. You don't have to get into the jungle or the Meat Inspection Act because that's what B and C are gonna kind of give you an opportunity to do. Um, you could have talked about how this shows the government should be more involved, but the government is reluctant to kind of put these regulations in place. At least that's what the perspective seems to be indicating in this particular cartoon. Uh, you could have talked about how this kind of symbolizes the growing role of the president. Here, Theodore Roosevelt is a large figure kind of overseeing this kind of process. Presidents, remember all those presidents during the progressive or before the progressive movement that we forgot, Rutherford, Benjamin Harrison, Grover Cleveland, the ones that you, you, they didn't really do a whole lot. Roosevelt is the exception to most presidents of that, this period of time. And so you could have talked about the growing power of the presidency. Um, whatever you decide, it has to reflect the artists and their view about the role of government. If you look at B, B is an interesting one. Uh, it says one event or development led to the historical situation. So this is like, do you understand the context? And, you know, and these same skills apply to the DBQ. Do you understand the context of this image? Why is Roosevelt investigating this? And so here you could say one development that led to the historical situation depicted in the image was the rise of muckrakers who exposed problems in society to the American public. So it's showing you the context. And then it gives an example. Upton Sinclair's book, The Jungle, brought awareness to the consequences of the lack of business regulations to workplace safety and the nation's food. Public anger following publication of the book led to calls for government action. Now, I wanna point something out which, which the opposite thing that happens oftentimes is students see this, they think of Upton Sinclair, they might've done an activity in class, they really liked the jungle, they thought it was cool reading about rat poop on meat, thought it was gross, they like the struggle of immigrants portrayed. They like the story of the book being written to appeal to socialist principles. And then they get into the SAQ and they dump everything they know onto the page or type it into the computer 
if we're doing testing during a pandemic. Please don't do that. You don't need to get into Upton Sinclair famously said, I aimed at the nation's heart and I hit him in the stomach. And then he actually wrote it because he was a socialist and he did it. He wanted to focus on the immigrants, but the American public didn't care. And then, and then there was rats and then they pooped on them. Like you keep it simple. One event or development which led to the historical situation. What is that? Muckrakers, Sinclair wrote a book, exposed a problem, boom, done. If you are able to do that, you're gonna find that you'll have time to do all the SAQs and you can use any number of examples. You don't have to use this one. For this particular one, you could have talked about a number of different things. You could have talked about how other muckrakers were kind of exposing problems at this time. It's just saying, what's the historical context behind this? Um, you could have talked about how there was a, a more literate public because public education was expanding, which meant that middle class reformers could reach more people, including American women who are often seen as the guardians of the home. And so therefore, they're going to be angry about what they're reading about in the jungle. Whatever it is, make sure it's relevant to the prompt and you'll be good to go. Looking at the time, we're a little bit close to the end, so I want to make sure we got C. So here's C. C is asking you to explain one specific outcome of progressive era debates about the role of government in society. It's just asking you about the role of government in society. It's not even asking you necessarily about this particular cartoon. But if I'm writing this, I'm going for the easiest, the lowest hanging fruit, as they say. So I'm going to say something like one specific outcome, and I didn't say this, this is a student of progressive era debates. And I teach my students when we do this in class to always use the language of the prompt, but to make sure you follow it with your claim or your argument or your answer. Because it just makes, it makes you kind of make sure you're answering the right thing. So debates about the role of government in society was passage of the Pure Food and Drug Act and the Meat Inspection Act. If they didn't mention both, they'd still be fine, but both those laws were passed the same year. These two acts signed by Theodore Roosevelt were important accomplishments of the square deal and marked a shift from the laissez-faire philosophy. You didn't even have to include that. They didn't have to include that. But you could have just talked about how the government's playing a more active role in the nation's food and drugs as a result of this book. You could have even talked about how there was trust busting because it's asking you about the role of government. And remember, the theme of today was reform movements. And whether or not it was the progressive movement, the New Deal, or the Great Society, which we really didn't cover, but it is on your graphic organizer, all three of them did lead to calls for an increase of the federal government's role, but also led to critiques about the government doing too much, which is another key thing you need to understand in a push, which is not everyone agrees with these policies. And so what were the debates about the role of government? How did those debates play out? But in terms of the SAQ, as long as you're answering the question, you're going to be good and you're going to be in a position to get the point on A, B, and C. And the last one that we didn't get to, because most of you probably haven't covered it, but just to kind of give you a quick preview, is looking at this same kind of question from SAQ number one, but comparing and contrasting the great society. And one big difference is, just to set you up for success moving into the next couple of weeks, is the great society is going to confront the issue of race and poverty, not during a Great Depression, but just in general during the 1960s. And one similarity is there are going to both lead to dramatic increases of the role of government, and they're going to lead to new debates about the role of government. And it's 459. So I'm going to pause for just a moment to see if there's any questions in the chat or if there's any comments. How are we feeling out there? Hopefully this is making sense. Makes sense to me, but my computer is always smiling at me, so I never know. I think we're good for today. All right. Hey, we are loving your participation, everybody. Would you let us know if you are loving this and thinking this is a great thing? Give us a thumbs up on YouTube. We hope you come back next Monday, same time, same place, set a reminder, okay? Um, 
again, check out the Bill of Rights Institute's website for their homework helps, their videos, their primary documents, Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness. It's a great book. It's a great resource. And if your teachers don't know about it, let them know about it. Let them know about all the great stuff there. Um, and again, the We the Students essay contest, 500 to 800 words, and it could get you some cash. So we're glad to have you here. Let's see you again next week. Everybody have a great night, and we'll see you again.